Hello, hello. I'm Ben Pick, and with me tonight is Abdullah Munawar, Mike McCabe, and Ken Toller. And we are here for another meetup of the OWASP Northern Virginia group. Um, so Mike and Ken are going to give a talk very, very shortly on cloud security within chaos. And I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. So our next meetup will be July 16th. Um, so we'll post the information on that shortly. And for everyone within the YouTube chat, we're going to have some time at the end to go through questions. So if you have any questions, just please throw them in there and we will try and get to them as best we can. So without any further ado, uh, Ken and Mike, it is all yours. Great. So. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thanks everyone, whoever is out there who joined. Uh, hopefully it's more than one person. But hey, mom, if you're watching. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about cloud security at scale. Um, so to start, why listen to us? Um, I'm uh, Michael McCabe. I'm a cloud security consultant. I work for MBM Consultants. Um, I spend a lot of time inside companies, uh, both as a consultant and internal blue team, working on cloud security and kind of dealing with different um, challenges that large companies, especially financials, have when dealing with cloud security. Ken? And yeah, sure. No, and um, you know, as Ben introduced, I'm Ken Toller. So I've been back, back now back into the consulting world for a little over 10 months at this point, focused mainly on application security modernization and cloud security and DevSecOps transformations uh, focused in the fintech space, which is a lot of what our examples are. But prior to that, I spent a lot of time on the corporate blue side of things, trying to build a security program where you're invested in more than just the like a consulting engagement and have a bit more say in how ideas manifest in the real world. And I think it's important to try and see both sides of the world if you have an opportunity because it exposes you to these challenges on both ends and gives you a perspective to some of these internal challenges you wouldn't have if you spend you know all of your career or your time in, in one or the other. Uh, but on the blue side, it's a lot like this, just, uh, you know, moving through and um, and taking a lot of hits. Yep. So what are we talking about today? Um, so Ken and I have known each other for a long time. We've worked together in the past and we started kind of sharing uh, kind of day to day stories about what our work was like. Um, and we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of kind of stories that were similar in terms of the challenges we faced when dealing with um, cloud security. We also done a lot of application security. So we, you know, we've seen a lot of the same issues. Um, and so we decided to put a talk together um, to kind of talk about those challenges and those those stories, both the wins and losses, the successes and failures that we've seen um, in our different uh, interactions. Um, and so if you haven't picked up yet, this is a Simpsons theme throughout the entire thing. Um, so we based our talk around three different um, companies. Now they're not 100%, you know, one company, they're kind of a mix of different companies, but they're all examples in kind of different situations, different um, kind of parts of their life cycle to cloud maturity. Um, and so we'll cover kind of different wins and losses based on these stories. So to start it out, um, Bart's banking. So this was, a company that um, was very early in on the cloud kind of world. They decided to go all in on cloud, um, move completely completely away from on-prem. Um, it was a strategic initiative. Just everyone has to move off of on-prem by a certain date. That date, of course, always slips, but um, that was the overall goal. And when the you know CEO says we're moving all in on cloud, people listen. Um, and so they had, you know, they started in AWS from very early on. So they had, um, you know, years of experience, years of, of applications um, in AWS. They have hundreds of applications running. Um, but some of the challenges they faced um, were the complexity that came over all those years of using um, the cloud and, and deploying applications out to the cloud. So um, kind of taking a step back, one of the, these folks are somewhat of a gold standard in my mind in terms of uh, maturity because um, I kind of think about cloud security as uh, sort of like the OODA loop, if you're not familiar with that, it's like an old um, uh, fighter pilot kind of method of, 
you know, you, you observe what's going on, you orient on the kind of different pieces of information you have, you decide what to do and you act. And I think about that, um, I think about cloud security in the same way in terms of maturity, because the first thing you do when you start using cloud resources is you don't know what you have. People deploy tons of EC2s, they don't know how many VPCs, you have shadow IT. Um, so just being able to observe is kind of the foundational level. And then you can you know, decide what you should have out there, what you shouldn't have out there, what the you know, correct configuration is. And then you decide and you act and you, you know, either fundamentally change things or simple remediation. But that's kind of the, the flow that I see with um, more mature uh, cloud implementations. It's that ability to, you know, have an inventory of what they have out there, be able to make quick decisions based on that. Um, and, you know, uh, if you don't know who owns a server, you can't patch the server. If you don't know who owns a Lambda, you can't you know, you know, fix something with that. But this company, Bard's Banking, was much more mature in this way. So they had, you know, very strong tagging, which led to accountability and, you know, traceability back to, um, back to uh, who owned that app so who could fix fix those things or fix that cloud misconfiguration. Um, so that's, that's a very basic level of security, very basic level of maturity, but it's something that I see a lot of companies who are moving into the cloud don't have yet. They don't have that basic level of, uh, of maturity. So uh, Bart's banking, they started very simply, you know, typical um, EC2 based deployments, um, three, three tier web applications, nothing too complex, something that, you know, a, uh, a diagram can, can kind of give you an idea of what they were doing. Um, but over time, this became much more complex. So multiple accounts, you know, VPC peering, um, different complex like on-prem to cloud interactions. Um, you know, the number of AWS services, of course, increased exponentially over time. And then finally, they end up in this mess, which is, um, I always joke with Ken to say that in every big company, there's like one person in the basement who actually knows how everything runs. and. It's like the Oracle you have to go to to you know get an answer of why these two EC2 instances can talk to each other even though there's no you know routing between them or something like that. So there's it, this is what it ends up eventually where it's just a completely confused kind of mess of configuration and no one really knows how it works except for the crazy architect in the basement. So the kind of the point is they're a good example of they have a lot of experience in the cloud. They have many years of kind of building things and refining the way that they want to build things, but they still have a huge amount of complexity that's come from um, that's come from you know using the cloud after all these years, um, and that that leads to some pretty funny things where you can you know ping a production server from on prem when you really should not be able to do that. Um, I think networks over time trend to be flat, and that's the same here. Um, so it's some issues with you know the the complexity um, authentication authorization you always kind of lose track of who is doing that at some point you a lot of teams assume that you know this api gateway is doing the authentication i don't need to do it um you know tracking data ingress that's very difficult where your data is coming from um and then data scientists who i'll get to in a moment but um you know one thing people talk about the cloud being kind of infinitely scalable but um there's some pretty uh low soft and hard limits. So, I mean, for example, here, we have 1500 uh, customer managed policies in an AWS account. That's a soft limit that can be raised, but more often than not, for large companies, I'm seeing this actually be hit and then actually have to be raised. And so if you think about 1500, 2000 policies, and you're gonna have you know a small security team be able to understand and reason about how those different policies interact and what you know who has access to what, it's almost impossible. Um, so that's that's what happens as cloud footprints grow. Is they you know you lose your ability to, to understand the interactions, understand the relationships. So meanwhile, in security, we have you know five five security folks, ten security folks in cloud security. Um, we're doing our best to you know fight whatever fire comes up, um, and just accepting the risk where we have to because we can't you know we can't fix that issue quickly enough where the business says it's not a big enough issue for uh, for them to stop their deployments or their architecture or using their COTS product. So um, 
you know, security is, I think we've made a, a mental shift from being just the people who say no for the most part. So people are trying to be more enabling, enabling while um, uh, making things secure. But a lot of times we're putting out fires and, you know, plugging holes and the, the CISO or the CTO or the CEO says, hey, I want to use this thing. So let's figure out how we secure that. Um, and so a word on data scientists. I generally like to ask people if there's any data scientists in the room before I tell the story. So I feel bad about like telling it. 10 seconds and see if there's any data scientists <laughs> on the chat. Yeah, I'll wait and hear if anyone yells. <laughs> but um, so with data scientists, uh, I have a lot of respect for folks that are in this field, you know, clearly smarter than me, um, a lot of complex math and um, Excel that's a joke, uh, used in data science. And I don't mean to disparage their, their, you know, that field as a whole, but, um, in my interactions with data scientists, they're usually a kind of a source of issues where data scientists want access to do, you know, they want full access to production data, production like data to run Python scripts on, to create their models, to run their models. Um, and, that often conflicts with you know the secure baseline that you're trying to build, the configurations you're trying to enforce. Um, so that's a data scientists are always kind of an interesting, um, interesting group to to work with. So this kind of beginning the first example, but kind of what are the things that I've learned from working with arts banking? Um, so. Michael Jordan, ahead of his time, uh, amazing, um, amazingly knowledgeable about cloud security. Um, so he, you know, he had some fundamentals. Or he, he was all about the fundamentals, and I think that's really that's um, that's really where you need to start. It's not about you know the fanciest tool. It's not about buying whatever you know thing that vendor is going to say is going to fix everything. It's really about getting the fundamentals down, and that means you know having an inventory of what you have out there, you know, having a good tagging strategy, making sure it's enforced, being able to detect drifts from your security configurations, um, alerting on that drift and making sure that that's not all noise, you know, because you can't just have a thousand alerts going off every minute, no one's gonna pay attention to it, and then eventually something will be real. Um, and then being able to reme remediating that quickly. Um, so figuring out how you redeploy that resource to make it secure. So I'll hand it off to Ken. Yeah, so Mike, we do have a uh, a couple of questions. I know you can't see them, but did you want to try to answer some of that against Bart's banking now? Are they data scientists? Because if they are, no. <laughs> There's one data scientist in here that says he won't take it personally. So sorry, Sam. Sam, uh, well, um, then I but, will. Uh, I'll go way harder next time on the data scientist. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. So uh, uh, Pete asks, you know, how did Bart's implement? How did Bart's banking implement strong tagging? and who established a standard? Presumably they used organizations very er early on. Yeah, so it's kind of an iterative thing uh, because more and more more and more and um, pieces of technology have been able, have kind of given you the ability to do it. Um, so I think the big thing is you can't have any manual deployment of, of resources, maybe in like a sandbox or a lower environment that no real data ever goes into, but I think the only real way to do it is through something like um, a pipeline. So Terraform, CloudFormation, Service Catalog, you have to use those types of um, tools to enforce that. And really you should take the ability, you should take the responsibility away from developers to be on the hook to do that. And it really should be automated. So if you have you know, a pipeline uh, provision for you, it should just automatically tag whatever you put through that pipeline. And Ken kind of talks about some some technologies later that you can use to enforce those kinds of things. Um, CFN Lint is one that is a linting tool for cloud formation. Um, and there's some other ones for Terraform as well, but you have to get away from the manual provisioning of resources that, you know, having the developer be responsible um, for tagging resources correctly is, uh, is just not gonna work. Um, it's not anything to do with developers, it's just typical human error. Um, you can also do things pro uh, proactively like cloud custodian. You can enforce tag policy through tearing down resources that aren't properly tagged. Um, in terms of tagging strategy, that kind of is based on how your cost centers are set up, how your you know CMDB is set up, things like that. Um, so it's a little custom, but 
having a lease attribution to, you know, the team that's responsible for the app and who gets charged for the resources. This is kind of the basic, the basics. Yeah. And then the other question comes from uh, Pete again, and uh, it says, you know, are the well-architected quote unquote frameworks helpful to address after the fact also in quotes security issues? Yeah, I think so. But I think like any framework or any guidelines, they're generic. So they're not, they might not always fit, you know, what you're doing, but I think they're a good baseline for how you want to, you know, architect things. Um, it, it does really just depend on how you all are using the cloud. Um, I think the big thing and kind of talk about this later too, is determine how you're planning on using the cloud. Don't just say like, Hey, we set up an AWS account. It's charged to some you know, someone's credit card, figure out early on, you know, how are we going to do these things? What is our model going to look like? Are we going to be all EC2, all Lambda, um, some, somewhere in between? Um, so I think those are good guidelines, but most folks will outgrow those at some point. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and so th those are the questions for your section so far. I just want to make sure we got to them. Um, so, yeah, uh, on, to, on to the next section. So, um, what you can take from that generally is that, you know, financial services in general can really be this cloud hell that we're going through, just like Ned Flanders is going through his own personal hell here. Um, and that you can be handcuffed by all kinds of unexpected legacy issues, compliance, regulation. But ultimately, you know, money matters to people, especially in, in finance and fintech. And so when things go wrong, it can really lead to real damage. Um, and so we need to take very careful consideration of, of change and so of this migration to the cloud. So I do want to talk um, a little bit about, um, let me see if I can get these slides to move. Uh, Lisa's Lending, which is an, another uh, sort of pseudo organization. It's a combination of a few. Um, that, but it's inspired by an organization that I worked for for a long time. Obviously, names are changed to protect the innocent here, but uh, it's a, a medium-sized business with a startup culture, doing lots of innovative things in finance. Um, they have a, a lot of great teams in development and DevOps that are hungry for new stuff, and they're starting to get bound down by regulations and partnerships, specifically around SaaS and inside of the data center. And I, I don't want you to get the idea, especially in this type of organization, that um, these are folks that have been around for you know 20 or 30 years and they're sort of stuck in legacy, but it's it's around folks that want to change the status quo. They're amazing, smart people, especially on the tech side. Uh, you've got DevOps teams and developer development teams that are eager to, to change things and to move things into the cloud. Uh, so I just want you to understand that this is not just a, you know, a, a grinding machine, that people are really there to push the envelope and the desire is there to change. So um, what I want to do is delve into some general security problems that are just general functional problems for financial services and fintech especially. But uh, this, this particular organization is focused on those medium-sized startup sort of feeling ones. So um, I'm just waiting for those slides to change. So uh, DevSecOps is, is really all about uh, innovating and moving security left, uh, growing it right, closer to you know keeping things closer to design, uh, integrating things throughout the development pipeline. But it, you know, and just like I said, it's also about pushing right into secure operations and overall uh, software assurance. But in order to do that, you need to move through uh, like some major barriers and, that are common themes throughout fintech. And uh, Lisa's lending had all of these. Uh, and I, I broke them down into these three, complexity, regulation, and legacy systems. And uh, over all of those, just process. And with this, we're not just talking about your specific company, uh, small, medium, or large, uh, even though this is sort of wrapped around a, a small business, but all of the financial baggage you bring from other companies, whether that's partners or vendors that you interact with or software as a service and all of these existing integrations that you have. And in finance, there's also these uh, sort of niche organizations that handle things like, you know, bank statements or credit accounts or account history, identity, privacy, some asset verification, 
And there's such a small number of vendors that do this well, that carry a lot of weight uh, or um, industry behind them, that you almost have to look at it like a supply chain or library management that you would in, in traditional application security. These are your Equifaxes, your LexisNexis, or um, First Data, or if you're in finance of the world, but you're also talking about small players that might do one component like OCR or you know PDF reading or something along those lines. And, and rather than focus on all of these um, in an organization, a lot of times you're outsourcing this. And when you're not a development or a tech company, the DIY and build it yourself may not be an option. So you're outsourcing to all of these other vendors so that you can sort of focus on what makes your particular fintech organization special. So these legacy systems combined with this regulatory compliance for whatever your particular line of business is, whether that's PCI or SOX or SOC2, et cetera, um, in addition to anything that any of these vendors or partners want you to work with, um, that's what sort of establishes how you attack uh, regulation within the security aspect of things. So um, in the case of Lisa's Lending, we'll, we'll take a partner example, right? Uh, Lisa's Lending didn't really ever have to deal with things like PCI because they're, they're just lending things, right? Um, and in this particular case, it was FIPS 140-2 level three, which for us was uh, really focused around um, the physical aspect of managing keys in an HSM that at the time AWS and other cloud providers weren't supporting. And so you're, you're sort of adding this manual complexity to, um, to an industry or to, a, to a, um, uh, a fintech company that is not ready for that, but their, their partners are looking for that and all of the people that they wanna work with is looking for that. Uh, some other things that add to that complexity are um, automating something that isn't read readily automated, like COBOL or mainframes that these um, these folks are are working within. And typically, uh, I like to ask people who you know who's worked with a mainframe. And what comes out of that is usually uh, maybe one or two hands. But what I what I like to focus on is that there's an eight character password max on uh, mainframe systems. And so when you take something like that, uh, and, and we're not even talking about special characters, and then you ap apply that to like best practices for cloud, you run up against this wall where you're like, well, I can't actually commit to doing that and taking and modernizing this application while I still have these legacy systems. But I've got a finance um, organization that I'm partnering with or something along that. I see uh, somebody um, with a very command line username <laughs> is, uh, is raising their hand to the mainframe question. So, yeah. Um, so you understand, you know, that you're, you're trying to take and modernize these legacy systems that aren't ready for that. So you have to come up with these creative solutions, whether that's multi-factor authentication or establishing something in the perimeter or doing something creative, but you can't really take these, you know, security best practice guides and apply them directly to your particular situation. Uh, so that's where we're, we're trying to go with with complexity. Um, so all in all, I mean, I just want folks on this that are listening to this to think about the layers that we apply security to and how, and then we'll dig into sort of what we talk about within those within those layers. Um, sorry, I'm just working through the slide management here. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> so I want to talk about this particular image because I have a real problem with it. It comes up in a lot of conversations that I have around cloud specifically and cloud migrations um, because you see this all the time around the responsibilities that you no longer have from a functional perspective when you move to the cloud. And what bothers me is that even though you know SaaS is, yes, uh, offloading a lot of this responsibility to uh, software as a service providers, there are still configurations within each of these categories that we have to focus on. You know, there's still a networking component of configuring your software as a service, your platform as a service, your infrastructure as a service. It's just that it's abstracted or there's some other method that you need to use in order to implement that type of security. But your networking security engineers will probably be the best assets to you to help you with that guidance. 
And um, I, I just added this slide uh, um, yesterday. I, I like where Microsoft goes with this um, in this image, the shared responsibility model. Um, if you think about how shared responsibility, the shared responsibility model has been marketed, it's, it's just like that slide before, where you sort of have this very binary understanding of who has responsibility where. But what Microsoft is trying to highlight here is that you know, you still share some responsibility and in infrastructure and identity when you move to SaaS because you're trying to, um, you, you're still going to have some shared responsibility within a specific service. It's not cut and dry that just because I'm using SaaS, I have nothing to worry about. So if you're a Salesforce organization and you're like, well, Salesforce is taking care of my security, you know, you have to rethink about um, how you approach that uh, moving to the cloud. So just an aside there. So all in all, like because there's these differing definitions of shared responsibility model and how we approach cloud security and all of these kinds of things, um, it just leads to cloud confusion. And Homer is just as confused as anyone in the cloud. And so the, the question is, how can we take the next step if no one shares the definitions and how do we establish you know, a working relationship that we can move forward? Uh, and so uh, with that, I want to talk about how we approach it at Lisa's Lending. And with Lisa's Lending, the, the method that we used was trying to sit back, determine what's important to us, and decide that we're going to secure that and secure that well, and, um, and through it become compliant. But we're saying, how can we help uh, you as a team, as an organization, achieve these goals as opposed to tack on more work you know, we're trying to get away from the the security gate model of this is everything that's wrong with your code or this is everything that's wrong with your organization and you need to go and fix it. It's it's working on that collaborative nature of whatever you want to call it these days, DevSecOps, security operations or operation security or whatever. So for Lisa's Lending, the first one of these was stability. This was a, a really big deal. How do we keep the lights on for the customer, make sure it's all running? Uh, while having a limited security team and a limited team to do that and still use all of these fun things that we're talking about, whether it's serverless or, you know, Lambda or S3 or like, how do we incorporate that but maintain a stable environment? The second was resource management. Knowing that our teams come from development backgrounds, network engineering, uh, infrastructure backgrounds, that they're now new to the cloud. Um, and that the talent was largely focused on this data center work and this development work with network engineers, Java developers, and um, and whatever. As a relatively uh, progressive organization, uh, how do we move forward? Luckily for Lisa's Lending, uh, within that organization, we had a really stellar DevOps team that's familiar with automation, who already had a really good reputation in the organization, and um, we had a good relationship with from a security perspective. So we can use that as an asset to further sort of the security goals. And the last piece uh, sort of probably seems like a complete deviation from the theme, but it's around secret and key management. And the reason that we picked this is because if we had to pick one thing to prioritize and focus on, given a, a lot of the factors that we were going through, where we were uh, at that point with the security posture was this is what's going to move us furthest in the right direction. And it was also something that was going to establish some functional add to the organization with a security mindset. It wasn't just solving the security problem. It was also solving uh, a functional problem. And if you can find something like that, that moves your organization forward beyond the security aspect of it, um, that's going to be a really powerful project to get people moving and underfoot because it's benefiting them. It's not just gating them off. Um, so I want to just take a look at a bit on that approach um, and, and how we look at that from a security perspective. So when you're talking about cloud security, a lot of folks will tell you about the security services that are in, in with whatever cloud service provider they're talking about. And even, even Mike's kids are talking about <laughs> this uh, as we speak. But um, a lot of folks want to look at it and say, what, what are all these sexy security services that are being launched at reinforce or um, reinvent? 
cloud HSM becomes FIPS 140-2 level three, you know, in whatever, two months. Uh, KMS, can you can auto-rotate your secrets and do all of these things with identity and access management for, you know, it'll solve all of your identity issues or use secrets manager because, you know, you can do all these fun things with secrets manager. And that's great. If you're a cloud native startup that's coming in and can take advantage of those features right away. Um, but we were in this, you know, unique position at the organization to be able to add some value at that time. Um, but we couldn't use all of these tools that were there. And what we recognize is that, look, security is usually this cost center. And we have so much trouble getting budget because it's, you know, it's always that fear, uncertainty, doubt uh, problem, or you're trying to convince someone that, uh, you know, of the potential loss. And when we do that, it's out of fear. So it's usually a, a lose-lose and it's a lot of people being grumpy about it. And so we tried to look at these major initiatives, those themes that I talked about uh, in the organization and how we could pick priorities in our team that provided the entire organization with a solution with this formula of time, money, and effort. We had to be able to say things like, um, we want better, easier account management, reducing the time to provision users with less money and an easier integration over the alternative. Not only are your secrets more secure, but they're better secrets. They're more complex. Uh, the recovery aspect of it, we want to be able to auto-rotate those secrets and reduce the attack footprint. We want to make sure that people that don't need to know these secrets uh, don't know them. Some other things to consider in that vein are outsourcing things like authentication by saying, you know, without knowledgeable developers, specifically in authentication and authorization, and this being something that's so hard to do, we either have to train development teams up in, inside of this specialty, and that's a huge effort, or we can outsource this to a vendor that we trust. And yes, we're taking on a bit of a trust risk there. Uh, but what is the weight? Do we want to manage uh, a vulnerability in that type of software, or do we want to outsource it to someone that has an entire company dedicated to this? And that's a decision that you make internally. Um, so I just want to look at this slide really quickly, and that sort of sums up you know, the journey for leases lending. But to put it into a picture, um, you can see that you know, with, with Lisa's lending, you have a lot of this data center culture and you're trying to move to cloud, but um, your cloud strategy, when you're talking about security, it shouldn't be these bolt-on security models. It's like, how can we add security functionality through different phases that allows us to be on top of it and, and serves as a migration over a period of time by having these little successes that make security um, either a quick win or a solid win. And for us, it was that auto rotating of secrets that allowed us to do that because we were saying, you know, if you if you're if you're looking at a secret management capability and you're able to not only remove that aspect from the developers just thought process, um, you know, we can add time development time back in the form of you know monetary value by making sure that they don't have to manage these. And when we go through the process of rotating these secrets over time, you know, we don't have to have this big long meeting, get all of the database administrators together, all of the de DevOps folks together, all the developers together, change these secrets in these individual aspects and take time from all of their days to do that. We can just use something like, you know, a HashiCorp vault to auto, auto rotate those, or if you are cloud native, use something like Secrets Manager. So this sort of shows that progression. We move from data center with like this highly available HSM infrastructure and, and going through that to starting to think about what cloud looks like, leveraging things like EC2 and maybe RDS inside of the cloud, uh, starting to try out things like Vault and Docker to see you know, where that plays. And then maybe you know as we cross over, um, we can start to think about things like Kubernetes, but that that secrets management component has to carry through all of that. So you can't just throw a secrets manager in there. Um, and with that, that sort of ends this section. Uh, I can see questions, so I'll go to Pete. You're hitting us with questions. So um, I'll, I'll definitely answer those. So uh, Horsepen2007 says, there is a saying that cloud security is one configuration 
from disaster. How real is that? I think that is super real. Um, and we talk about uh, infrastructure as code a little bit later, but um, automation is, is something that you have to be really careful with. And I'll get into this a little bit um, uh, as we go on. Because if you're automating a bad configuration, you're right. Like it can be, you know, I configure administrator on some rogue account and it goes through and makes that mistake across an entire fleet of instances or an entire, you know, um, stack. And same thing with like opening a port or something along those lines, which is why what we focus on later is how you should be taking infrastructure as code and managing that through the same application security process, your SDLC, as all of the other code that you develop. You know, that should go through the same type of review. Now, the benefit is that your recovery time to that is a lot faster. Um, when you notice that problem, if you're, if you're able to find that anomalous activity, the configuration change to deploy the fix through that entire fleet is also just as fast. So your, your, um, your time that, that that actually exists is much shorter. Uh, and then the other one was, can't you use some IoT management infrastructure to manage some of this legacy infrastructure, install some green grass thing or et, et cetera? Um, you're going to have to clarify that one and we'll come back to it at the end. But I'm not 100% sure what you mean. <laughs> uh, so Pete, if you can just throw that in the chat, I'd, I'd be grateful. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Mike. Cool. Um, so our third example uh, is Homer's hedge fund. So um, this this company or groups of companies or whatever, not, not naming names, um, they're what I would consider uh, in a spot that's more typical of a lot of companies who kind of have dipped their toes into the cloud and now have a, uh, you know, a large infrastructure they didn't mean to have. So um, <clears throat> in terms of kind of what they look like. So about three, three or four years um, building things out in AWS, uh, the number of applications ramping up, um, you know, steadily going up. So more more apps moving into the cloud, more things moving from on-prem into the cloud. Um, the tooling and skills are still building. So, you know, someone being used to, to deploying apps onto on-prem infrastructure, you know, hardware is very different from in the cloud. Um, it definitely takes some time for for teams to kind of get the both how IEM works in the cloud and also kind of the ephemeral nature of cloud infrastructure. Um, at the same time, they're moving into multi-cloud, so you, you know there's no better way to you know make yourself insecure. If you can't secure one cloud, might as well add another one that's completely different, needs a completely different tool set. Um, and they're also building out the security services, so those still aren't you know quite mature yet. So they've uh, they've wandered into the cloud and they you know they can't really get out. Thank you again, Ken, for this, Jeff. Um, and it's not that this company wants to get out of the cloud. It's just that they went into it without a strategy for how you know what they wanted their environment to look like. And that doesn't necessarily play out you know immediately in the first six months, first year. Once you start getting up to you know 150, 100 applications in the cloud. That's when you start seeing those complexities that I was talking about um, in the the first set of slides about uh, Homer's hedge fund. Um, you know, it doesn't take long before you start seeing those complexities. So, what uh, what are they missing? So, in kind of uh, stark contrast to um, that's right, Bart's banking is what I'm comparing it to. In stark contrast to Bart's banking, um, they don't have a strong inventory. So they might be able to tell with some tooling, you know, what all the all the different apps that are out there, all the different resources that are out there, but they don't have that strong tagging strategy where, um, you know, they can quickly trace back who owns something and who can fix something. Um, you know, don't have vulnerability scanning all across the environment. Um, I think people in on-prem networks kind of take vulnerability scanning um, kind of, uh, they they take it as being much easier because everyone has a flat network on prem pretty much, and so you know you just install Nessus in a few different places and run your scans, and hit your slash whatevers. Uh, but in the cloud, things are generally more segmented, at least for a while. 
Um, and so establishing that vulnerability scanning, getting back to, you know, your central scanning reporting, that's, that is not in place yet. Um, along with the reporting in terms of, okay, what are, what are our vulnerabilities looking like um, and who owns those vulnerabilities? Um, and that all goes to, to tooling. And then a multi-cloud strategy, um, you know, you have to have a strategy for how you want to use the cloud, how you want to do AWS, how you want to do Azure, how you want to do GCP, and then also how you interact, how you have those different pieces um, interact because you'll see people who use, you know, like Azure AD as their federation that go into AWS. And now you have, you know, one cloud dependent on another cloud. Um, and you have to kind of you know determine how you want to manage those things because you don't want to have identity in in on-prem, identity in Azure, identity in AWS. Um, you need to be able to have centralized identity, but you have to have a strategy for how you want to do that. Um, and all the same things that are true for AWS in terms of you know IAM, in terms of data movement, uh, network complexity can also be true in Azure as well. So um, there's no free lunch. And I like to ask people if they get this joke, but this is a dad joke. This is a hybrid cloud. Um, so this company is also experimenting, you know, with some hybrid cloud because I think there's still an idea of hybrid cloud is the safe way to move into the cloud because it's our servers, but we can just kind of virtualize uh, infrastructure as we need. Um, so what is what is this company doing to kind of improve that, and what can companies who are in a similar position do. Um, so it's not, it's, I wouldn't say it's like in the worst position uh, or in the worst situation because there are some things kind of um, that they have in place that, that definitely help. Um, so a term that I think I say multiple times a day, but is patterns. So um, no special snowflakes for how, you know, you, you use infrastructure, no, every dev team uses a slightly different architecture their iem groups are slightly different or their you know ingress um from the internet for traffic is slightly different um you know standardizing how people use your applications it doesn't have to be one you know elb ec2 rds kind of pattern there could be multiple patterns for how you do that but figuring out what those those are <clears throat> and standardizing on them and then you know communicating that out that's very important because once you have those patterns for um, how you're going to use infrastructure, then you can build those guardrails around it. So if you say, okay, if you want, you know, in-memory cache, if you want um, something like Redis, you can use that. Here's the guardrails uh, around it. And that's when you go back to your automation. All your automation can have the guardrails you want in place. So, you know, using a custom KMS key, using at-rest encryption, making sure it's, you know, in a private subnet, all those kinds of things you can build in your pattern so that there's, there shouldn't be a way that a developer who can spin up Redis spins it up and it's you know uh, misconfigured. Um, a big piece of it, and I think this is an area that a lot of people struggle in, is standardizing what your access should look like because um, it's just it's such a behemoth. IEM is on its own, just its its own world, and it's very difficult to get right. Um, so you have to you have to design what you want your IEM to look like and then realize that you have to iterate on that over time. Um, I think generally what's worked is you build buckets for access, and then usually a lot of financials care about separation of duty, so you can't have too much overlap between those different buckets. Um, but it's a very, you know, I've seen some companies where people have, you know, too much access and some people, some places that have not enough access that so really impacts developers being able to get, um, you know, their work done. Um, so it's a it's definitely one of the harder parts of uh, of getting IEM right in the cloud is just how what are your kind of buckets of access. Um, but I think starting with you know what are your main roles to access cloud um, infrastructures? You have your developers, you have your deployers, support. You might have database folks, and you know building policies for those folks having dedicated policies, and then you know start tr with a trim down policy just what they need and then, you know, have a process to refine that over time. Um, but it can get, you know, it, it's an ongoing and ever evolving process, especially since AWS creates new, um, you know, new services. And there's sometimes interconnectivity between those IEM policies where one service needs to call another service, but that can introduce privilege escalation. Um, so that's definitely an area where security needs to focus on 
you know, having a say in how those are built out and also having some logic and, you know, reason for why they're built out that way. <clears throat> um, this company is also working, you know, they have a kind of a, a group of um, folks represented from different teams. So you have, you know, architecture, you have security, you have um, operations kind of working to define those patterns, um, you know, together. So it's not like, hey, we're doing this way and the security is coming in to say, no, you got to do it this way. It's one team working together. Um, and this leads to, you know, things like AWS service catalog, or you can use uh, Terraform for similar things, but building those patterns, um, automating it, and then just having those guardrails in place for people so they can't do the wrong thing. Um, another very powerful tool when it gets kind of better over time is AWS organizations. So, you know, if you're not using that currently, I suggest you do. And then you can really use a lot of the features of, of organizations to lock things down, um, centralize different tools like guard duty, um, centralized billing and SCPs, um, the control policies you can use uh, in AWS are very powerful. You can limit it down to, I want this account to only be able to spin up an EC2 in you know, Canada or something like that. And you can limit it down to those kind of kind of granular actions. And actually in SCPs, you can enforce tagging as well, but um, there's some caveats to that. So, you know, these are these are the ways this company are kind of improving things. And I think it's, it's where a lot of companies get once their cloud footprint grows to a um, certain amount. So, and kind of touching on multi-cloud again, um, I think, Multi-cloud gets talked about, um, I think, both from a vendor lock-in perspective and also kind of a reliability perspective. Um, anyone who's in AWS for any amount of time uh, and has kind of built their workflows out, you're, you're locked in. You know, you have your, you're using encryption that's based on uh, AWS KMS. You're using all your IEM as defined in AWS IEM. Um, and so you can either try to use AWS and not use those services and just completely miss out on, you know, the power of the cloud, which is automating those things and having APIs to drive so much of that versus doing it manually. Um, or you can just go in, you know, and use those services, but you are locked in. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And I don't think that multi-cloud should be a way to either avoid being locked in because you're afraid of price hikes, because actually as Azure's gotten more, um, you know, more, a bigger share of the cloud market prices have gone down over time. Um, so I really think multi-cloud should be, let's use these clouds for their strengths. Um, and they do have different strengths and Azure does things, you know, some things better than AWS and vice versa. Um, and the same thing with, uh, with Docker, people will think that they'll just spin up their, you know, um, their app and Docker, and then they can move it to wherever they want. But, you know, in reality, that's not true. If you're using ECS versus OpenShift versus Kubernetes, there's going to be some things under the hood that you can't just throw that Docker image around and expect everything to work um, the same. So um, cloud compliance. So uh, I always kind of joke that Ken and I are both uh, pretty technical folks. We spend a lot of time doing you know, code review and pen testing, um, kind of the, the hardcore security um, kind of activities and, you know, enjoy breaking things. Um, but over time, I don't know if it's because I'm older or I just, uh, you know, have to wear a suit more often, but um, compliance has been an area where I think it's been largely, not just ignored, but it's been, you know, um, really pushed to the side by security. People don't, people consider compliance as just the person who walks around with the, you know, checklist of like, are you doing this, this, and this? And they have no concept of, you know, why you're doing it. They don't understand the impact of it. Um, and I think that's true. It's a valid criticism. And a lot of times compliance folks aren't as technical as, you know, pure security folks. Um, but I think in the cloud, there's an opportunity to, to use compliance as um, a driver of, of security. And you would think normally, Compliance and security would go hand in hand. A lot of times, that's not true. But um, I think compliance—you um, know—if you take if you take those baselines you build out and you say this is what our target state looks like, and then you have a compliance function that checks for that and drives remediations because, especially in the financial world, compliance and audit are a huge driver of work. Um, so if you can use that as kind of your your um, motivation for people to fix things and you work as the security team to influence what the compliance footprint looks like 
it can be hugely beneficial for the security of your cloud. So um, I also think it's an area where uh, since everything in the cloud is API driven, you know, you, you don't have to manually configure things. You don't have to go in and check things, open up a file. You can just run commands or run, you know, different tools to check the configuration of your environment. And that leads into building your, you know, building your, um, uh, compliance kind of checklist, you know, you have to have at rest encryption, custom keys, you know, um, transport encryption, you must be using these regions, all those things you can use your pipeline to enforce and then use automation to confirm that it's that it's there and then use your compliance team to make sure that those things are remediated. Um, and I think, you know, coming from an AppSec background where you do pen test, you do code review very manually. You can't, you know, there's some tools that help automate it, but you're not gonna find the same results just running scripts um, against the code base or against, you know, a running app. You have to do manual work, but in the cloud you can do quite a bit automated. And so you can really see your whole footprint um, and what the configuration is with, you know, Python or Bash or whatever you really want. And that's very powerful for, um, for securing things, but I think that's where these two, where security and compliance need to kind of go hand in hand to, to work together. Um, so kind of wrapping up uh, with um, with these folks. So I mean, my, my takeaways from working with this group has been really define how, what you want the, um, your cloud world to look like. So what those patterns are gonna be, um, and I think security does play a big role in this. You might say that the app team should choose, but I, I think you have to you have to have security weigh on this because every design decision is going to have a security impact and possibly a compliance or audit um, impact as well. Um, and cloud isn't. I wouldn't say it's just a, a tech issue. It's really a people and organization problem. Um, you know, you see cloud is so big. You see different teams fighting for different kind of pieces of their. Um, pieces of their, you know, it's a land grab for different parts of parts of things. And really all the organizational dysfunction leads into kind of cloud dysfunction. Um, if your identity and access management and governance aren't being run well on-prem, they're not gonna be run better in the cloud. So you have to fix these issues. Um, and sometimes that means just revamping and starting fresh, but you have to fix these issues. So you can't, um, you can't just assume it's gonna be different but I also think cloud is a huge opportunity because as I talked about, um, it's just, everything is right there for you. It's all, you know, it's all abstract. It's all virtual, nothing really exists. So it's all just there for you to, to interrogate with uh, automation so you can understand what's out there and fix it very quickly. Ken. All right. Yeah, so you have a couple of questions and thanks to <coughs> everyone for uh, sticking in on this. Um, no one's here to like wave the flag to tell us to stop talking. So um, we're going to continue going down the, this path. Uh, but Mike, you had a couple of questions in this as well. Do you want to answer them now? Or you want to wait? Uh, no, I can. Uh, I can answer them. Let me see. I'm looking at the questions. Hey, Ping, how's it going? Um, yeah, so on-prem is definitely a big, a big challenge. So I think so, um, real quick, the question is, <laughs> uh, on-prem inventory is a big challenge in the cloud. What's the best practice for inventory? Um, is it any easier? Uh, yes and no. So it depends. I think it can be easier if you have, um, you know, if you have a good tagging strategy, if you have a good CMDB. That's another issue. Some people just don't have a good CMDB. So even if you had everything tagged with the right asset ID or app ID, whatever you call your, your identifier, um, if you don't have a centralized database of who owns those things, you're kind of back in the same spot. But the point is you can automate all that, all of that very easily um, if you have your deployment built the correct way. So it is easier in that, in that sense to actually do the legwork of getting information about your inventory if you have your practices built out, if that makes any sense. Um, but there's a lot of tools out there. There's clearly commercial tools that will help you with that. Um, Prismas and Divi and all different kind of things that will will do that interrogation of your cloud footprint and can look at multiple accounts. Um, there's also a lot of free tools and you can use the you know the command line to build out um, tools to to 
to kind of pull out that information. Um, billing dashboards are also usually very effective. Um, finance people want to know who's getting charged for what. So if some $500 charge, well, $500 in the world of financials is not that big, say $50,000 charge pops up, people want to know who's going to pay for it because it can't just hit some baseline budget over and over again. So that usually is a good place to go in terms of, okay, who's getting charged for this? And also people don't want to be charged for things that shouldn't be theirs. So that's a good driver of how you determine, um, you know, who's getting charged for what and who owns what. Um, how do you translate? Wanna, well, I just want yeah, to add to that. One of, the, one of the other things here is tagging strategy, right? One of the things that we have, and you, you sort of have the, the methodology to do this or the methods to do this with things on-prem like uh, Kubernetes or whatever. But um, using that tagging strategy in AWS, especially if you're just moving into AWS or you're just moving into cloud, um, establishing the tagging strategy early allows you to ensure that through infrastructure as code or through monitoring that you can find um, uh, inventory assets that don't have specific tags. You can tag things by risk. You can tag them by location or whatever your inventory management uh, CMDB is is focusing on. You can use tags to help you along with that. And I I think uh, the 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 biggest successes that I've seen are um, organizations that establish that tagging strategy early, as opposed to going back in time and trying to tag everything that's there. Um, I don't know, yeah. Mike, if you agree, but yeah, no, I agree. Um, I mean, I think the difficult one of the difficult parts about uh, the cloud is things scale so quickly. So, um, if a thousand different teams spin up a thousand different instances, you're now manually tracking down like, hey, who owns this, um, and then trying to get the right tags on it. So, I definitely agree that earlier, the earlier you do things um, and start kind of stopping the bleeding, the better. Um, how do you translate cloud baseline compliance to business compliance like PCI? So, I mean, uh, kind of back to Ken's point about that whole kind of layer of who controls what. So AWS will say, oh, all of our resources are, you know, PCI compliant or they're, um, you know, ISO compliant, all those types of things. And that's true, but so much of it is still in the implementation. But I also think that, um, you know, you can use cloud resources to make things compliant um, and then kind of use that configuration to point to how it's compliant. So a perfect case was um, having the encryption, having access to data and having the access to the key to encrypt data be two separate kind of levels of uh, authorization. It's very easy to do with um, you know, S3 and like a custom KMS key. Um, are you moving the thing? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I just uh, unlocked the remote and you know screwed everything up, but it's okay. Continue. No worries. Um, just make sure we don't have a ghost in our uh, slides. Yeah. So you can yep. do things like that where you can create that separation of control, and it's really it's very simple from an automation perspective to say like one person owns the key, one person owns the data. So even if you have access to you know the data, if you don't have access to the key, you wouldn't be able to read it, and create that like layer that layer of um, of control that can point to different. Um, you know, PCI or other kind of compliance uh, guidelines, but don't um, don't assume that just because AWS, you know, their compliance white papers say that you're PCI compliant, it means you are PCI compliant. You have to do a lot of legwork on your own. Kind of going back to Ken's point. Cool. So that's all the questions we have up to this point. And Pete, I haven't forgotten about you. Um, we'll get to the IoT management um, maybe at the end or something. But um, one of the things that we talk about, uh, in, especially in this talk, is we've we've gone through a lot of theory, a lot of real world scenarios. But it's you know when you come away from a talk at a conference, you want to be able to go and apply something that something. Um, so uh, you know we're gonna go into a little bit of you know what you can do today based on where you are. And the first category for that that I always start with is identity and access management. Because as far as um, what your best practices or cloud practices will detail, IAM always comes up first, whether it's because that's what uh, AWS wants you to focus on or whether that's because, um, you know, in something like CSA, you're talking about identity and access management as your new perimeter. And um, 
when we get into it, what I, what I'm the, the format for these is like, what I can do today is like, let's look at what a traditional approach looks like. Let's look at what like an iterative approach looks like, maybe the next step in automation. And then let's look at like how it can be if it's managed and testable through infrastructure as code. So for IAM in your traditional sense, you typically are assessing things with an auditor, whether that's internal audit or an external audit uh, in a spreadsheet. You have a user, um, for me, it's, you know, Relotnik, um, and then some dev manager that you have, and you have these split up in a spreadsheet and AWS and other cloud service providers will sort of expose that same type of functionality inside of IAM. You can uh, establish a role, you can export that into a, a spreadsheet. There's some tools that you can use like trusted advisor or, um, or exporting an, an IAM credential report to see when these are used, how they're used. And that provides a lot of information to your auditors. So when you're moving into cloud, your traditional approach, the important things to understand are, you know, what is available in terms of reporting to provide to your auditors, whether that's internal or external. Um, and then adapt AWS to mimic the same roles that you have that auditors are expecting uh, and follow that best practice guidance. But when we go to the next step, which is sort of this, how do we automate that or make that easier for auditors to, to look at, um, we start to look at things like infrastructure as code. And this goes back to um, the comment that was made earlier about, uh, it was something along the lines of the first, the um, cloud security is one configure, configuration away from disaster. And how real is that? And this is a, a good example, right? You have a set of users, right? This is a, a Terraform template called allocate roles. And what it's doing is taking these users and putting them into a development role. So from the automation perspective, this is really good because it means that I don't have to go and manually add these users every single time. And I also uh, don't, you know, if I'm going to change this, I don't have anyone that needs to log into the console and go and do this. What this allows me to do is to take this Terraform template and put it into source control so that when someone adds a, a developer or a user or whatever, I know this is a pretty, you know, simple example. You probably wouldn't see this in the enterprise um, or you probably wouldn't want this in the enterprise. But as an example, you can add two users to this. This can theoretically go through a peer review that peer reviewer can be an auditor, for example, or it can be a security person or whatever that looks at these Terraform templates for changes that may violate security policy. And then that goes through that, that SDLC. That also should be incorporated into the change management process as a ticket. So you have all of these eyes on this sort of automated path forward. And then you can see inside of the console, if you're using that as maybe you're providing your auditors with console level access to see what is the current state, they still have access to that within AWS. So it's, it's leveraging this infrastructure as code to pull that into your application SDLC, uh, your secure SDLC and treating that access addition as a, as a code review. So that's sort of like how, how you can take this into an iterative step if you're using something like Terraform or cloud formation. And then if we get into the managed and testable side of this, um, one of the things that I think we're still pretty young in this as an industry, there are some products out there that help with this like CFN Lint, which will lint your uh, cloud formation templates for errors or gross errors like um, allowing SSH access from anywhere or whatever. Um, but adding custom roles to that or adding custom rules is, is still sort of this process that you have to navigate through all of these open source projects or whatever, but it's possible. And I think that we're getting there as an industry. So if you're sort of at that level, then what you can start to do is completely remove this, act, this access through the console and start to put everything through, um, uh, code review. You can also leverage things that were talked about before, like AWS organizations and something that Lisa's lending did also was this use of STS roles to control how people access particular AWS accounts and funnel that access through change management and our ticketing process. And the code snippet that I have here is a rule that I just, you know, sort of off the cuff wrote for TerraScan, which will analyze Terraform templates. And it has those same stock rules that we talked about. But in this particular one, uh, the rule is looking for any time AWS EC2 full access, which is a standard uh, AWS default role, is added to a Terraform template. And it's 
automatically showing that I'm failing. So in in theory, if I've if I've removed access to the console from everyone except for a few people, and I forced everyone to establish new roles through Terraform templates, then this would this could potentially get caught in a CI/CD pipeline, and so that access check uh, happens inside of your code review. Um, so that's that's where we're going with with that. Uh, the next one, and sorry, I'm you know unlocking locking this remote. Um, what I, what I the goal behind this is to again help with that people aspect of this in helping your auditor, helping your development team by saying by being able to make these statements that people can't argue with. All access is controlled through change management and peer review, meaning that every every access change we make goes through this, and you know we've we've completely cut off access to the console. No one or only a few people have access to the AWS console. You can reduce your scope to those people. Maybe those are administrative DevOps folks. And all of those changes are made through Terraform and CloudFormation. You can see my previous statement, Mr. Auditor. Uh, you know, here, you know, you can just audit these users and everything else is handled through cha our change management process. Um, and then you can say something like changes are validated through standard test automation. So all the things that we're doing great in our test suite today are also established to our access control. So uh, another example, uh, just going back to the Lisa's lending piece of secrets management uh, is the secrets management uh, capability. So the problem there and what you'll often find is how secrets are mismanaged inside of an organization. So everyone knows like all the things in dev and staging, and maybe even prod, your developers are gonna have to test, they're gonna have to create weak secrets and they're constantly pushing configurations and trying to make things work and experimenting and doing all of these things and they're manually updated. Maybe they're even managing a spreadsheet by your infrastructure team. Um, so as, an ex as a real world example, you might have something like Ansible Vault, which is this manual way to encrypt configuration files or secrets files. So in this particular example, we have a, a, a database credential that gets encrypted by the development team before they push it up to Git it goes to get encrypted and they never accidentally you know push that out unencrypted and it's not saved in the commit history at all we're just going to assume that and then that gets pushed out to jenkins and then jenkins deploys it and we have you know the secret so we we've sort of been doing that sort of pgp mechanism of or you know encrypting before we even put it into transit but obviously there's a human error aspect to that and so that's sort of your traditional approach so if you use that in prod you can say that your secrets are always encrypted because that's your process, but because there's a human aspect of it, it's not really that testable. And then once it gets caught in the commit history, you're sort of screwed with that. So if we were to level that up it, with a sort of cloud in mind and the data center hybrid approach to it, what I've done is uh, taken this hybrid approach um, and um, I took Rails Goat as a, as a method to demonstrate this to show this hybrid approach to automatically changing and persisting secrets and removing developer access, but maybe retaining administrator access to a DevOps team. And in this case, we have Rails Goat, and I know this is insecure, but we have these environment variables that are in plain text for both Rails Goat and for uh, a Postgres database. And what we're able to do though, is remove that view through uh, perhaps OpenShift cluster permissions to environment variables from development teams. So even though we're sort of still insecure, we're at least uh, reducing the security footprint. And just an example of how an automated approach might work. Uh, I do have this uh, video, which maybe Mike, you can click that for me because I don't think I can do that from the remote. <laughs> um, and this is a little bit uh, slipshod, but what I'm trying to show here is that uh, if you open up something like Rails Goat or you open up something like Postgres, what you can do is create these sets of pods. Um, and you can see that Rails Goat works. I can register, I can work through this and um, do everything that I could do in this vulnerable application. Um, and that's all this is really demonstrating. It just takes a, a, a while to do that. Um, but what I want to show is just that the application is, is working. Uh, I think you paused it, Mike. All right, we can get Mike's password from one password. Um, <laughs> yeah. So now, if I look into the, if I go into Postgres and I look at the, um, just the information, 
uh, what I what I want you guys to focus on is um, the environment variables, I believe, if my mouse ever gets there. And all I'm showing here is that I can take this secret, and as a DevOps admin, I can change this secret and commit it. And then no matter how many pods exist for my particular secret, um, I can redeploy this database and I can go through it. Now, what this does is it makes Rails Goat not be able to access that database anymore because I don't have access to it. But what I want to demonstrate here is just that, that no, now no longer can I run a database migration from the Rails Goat pod, any Rails Goat pod, to this now new Postgres credential. But what that's done is, in theory, if that credential was compromised, I can immediately block access to this. And I can do it to all the pods from Rails Goat, and I can do it for all of the pods for Postgres. So as a DevOps admin, I can go in and say, all right, well, I'm going to go and change the Postgres password inside of the Rails Goat event variable. And now that gets persisted to every single pod. So really what this is trying to show is that I'm able to remove develop developers from doing any of these things and making it easier for my DevOps team to go and manage these secrets. They don't have to commit anything new. They can go and make a, an immediate recovery. They can, you know, if it's under load, they can grow the pod structure and go through that inside of um, something like OpenShift uh, or, you know, any standard Kubernetes cluster. And just to prove that, we're RSHing into the uh, Rails Goat pod and we're running a migration and just showing that now that I've changed that secret, I can go ahead and add, um, add that and run that migration. If this is the right video. Yeah, so it runs the migration. All right, um, so that's that example. Now, if we, if we were to iterate on this and say, remove access from the DevOps team, that's the ideal, right? Because we don't want anyone going in there to manage secrets manually or, or generate a weak secret and then perhaps put that inside of the, the database or the pod. And so what I'm showing here is, what we could start to do is rotate secrets through automation, maybe on reboot of the application. And Vault supports this with Postgres or, or something along those lines. And OpenShift will support this through secrets and webhooks. And the idea is that you can, every time that application is rebooted, that, ro that secret rotates for both the database and for the application, and that the, de the DevOps admin never has to have knowledge of that secret. If there's some troubleshooting step that the DevOps admin could go through, then you can use a break glass account to go and grab that credential. But then you can just say, well, I'm going to reboot the application. And then it's going to get a new secret. And even I, as a DevOps admin, don't have access to view that secret unless I go through that break glass account. So it reduces where you have to monitor and it makes your monitoring activity much more anomalous. You're not just you know looking at all these failed login events. You're able to say, if this account is ever accessed manually, then that's a problem and I need to react to it, maybe just reboot the application. So again, going sort of back to these the powerful statements piece and posture, if you can say to your auditor that secrets and credentials are automatically rotated with every application on reboot and no one has access to database credentials except through a break glass account, and when that break glass account is used, the credentials automatically rotated, they're not going to know what to say to you because it's going to be like, so no one has access to this credential and you can do things like say, yeah, we rotate it, you know, every day we reboot that application. So that application is constantly rotating credentials. So that age aspect of compliance becomes a, becomes a thing of the past in this kind of case. Um, so that's, that's where I'm, I'm going with that. So, um, finally, just sort of en ending, uh, the, the, the lengthy, um, version of this talk, we can go into some key tooling and, and guidelines. And I do want to talk about things that, that we've sort of addressed throughout this, which is infrastructure as code and coding everything that you can. And as application security professionals at, you know, OWASP Nova, think about now all of these things under your purview that are going into code infrastructure as code and thinking about how to apply application security practices to that, you know, be Batman in the Simpsons. But even further than that is you have to be a team player. So you're not Batman, you're Bartman, right? You need to figure out where these features are, are going to be 
helpful to your colleagues because unless you have that behind you, your you know your security idea is going to fall on deaf ears. You need to figure out how that is going to enable your partners in the organization. Uh, the, the second thing is finding a champion project. We talked about a few of them, secrets management, HSM. Um, we talked about encryption. Basically, what can not only what can enhance the security posture of the organization and of your practice, but how does it reduce time? How does it reduce money? And how does it reduce effort of any anything? You know, can you reduce the budget through through alleviating developer time? Can you reduce budget by you know optimizing the tool structure? Uh, going to cloud, whatever it might be, that's where you're going to find your success because it becomes no longer just a security problem or a security enhancement. It becomes an enhancement to the organization on the whole. And we're in a really unique position today in cloud and in this DevSecOps culture to be an enabler as opposed to a blocker. Uh, and lastly, the point is just to to be Doc Brown or the Terminator. Uh, and I use this because I, you know, I love time based movies and series or whatever. And it's just like, you know, try to predict the future a little bit, use tools that you can sort of see on the path to completion. So for Lisa's lending, it was HashiCorp Vault because Vault sort of bled that line over the course of four years to uh, enable cloud migration. And at the same time, maintain uh, a measure of security and enhance the security of the data, of the data center um, footprint. Um, and that ends that section. So I'll turn it over to Mike to talk about just summarizing what we learned. Yeah. So just to kind of wrap things up, I mean, Ken and I uh, have different kind of experiences and work in different places, but I think we, we both learned some of the same lessons. Um, and we've worked with small companies and large companies. And, you know, we, we realized that cloud security is hard at any scale um, from startup to especially large, larger companies. Um, and the things are kind of, we've, I think we've hit this quite a few times, but plan early and, you know, adopt, adapt often to the changes that are happening. Every reinvent, just throw out the playbook and, you know, start fresh. Um, that's only half, half joking about that. Um, and, you know, as security folks, you have to be comfortable with complexity. You're, you're not going to get a simple cloud. You can simplify certain things, but it's not going to be simple overall and understand you know your risk trade-offs where are you accepting some risk to you know potentially get more business value but also what are your compensating controls for those things so um if you're still listening to us after uh an hour 15 minutes thank you very much for for listening to us and um hopefully you enjoyed this thanks and special shout out to uh, springfieldpunks.blogspot.com who provides the non, uh, you know, Simpsons official things like, uh, you know, Baby Yoda here. Um, and also, I think we have a couple of questions if we have time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, guys. I just want to go through a couple of questions um, if, if for, for as long as you guys feel like staying on the line. So we're all stuck at home, so... <laughs> So one of the questions is, are you seeing auditors become savvy with IAAC? Are they asking about drift detection? Um, and how are you tracking drift in your prod infrastructure versus your Terraform deploy code? So I'll speak from my perspective. Uh, it depends on who the auditor is. Um, when I worked at one financial organization, um, the auditors are actually taking um, like AWS courses to get so their questions made a lot of more sense. So that was a good, a good thing since they actually wanted to learn about, um, you know, about uh, the clouds. They could ask the right questions. That's of course going to vary depending on the if it's internal audit, external audit, what the different organizations are. Um, I would say, yeah, the question has gone from okay, who can who can do these things in your environment? Kind of the separation of duties and and access management questions to okay, how do you detect? That these things have happened and how quickly can you remediate these things? Um, I think that has definitely shifted somewhat where people want to know, okay, we know things are going to go wrong. How quickly can you, you know, detect and remediate that? Um, do you have anything to add to that, Ken? Yeah, I mean, 
I, I think that auditors in general are becoming more tech savvy as we move to the cloud. And I was I was just talking to an auditor the other day that's OSCP certified. And, you know, like you don't normally see that. And I think that that's sort of this, um, there, there's a new generation of auditors and security professionals coming out that are, that are tech savvy and want to know this stuff. So if you start to explore um, some of those personalities and, and find someone that is technically oriented, I think that the biggest blocker to that is um, an inability for us as security professionals to sort of put egos aside and accept the fact that somebody might want to learn about the industry. So talk to your auditors and treat them as allies. That's all I can can really say to that. And I would have never known that person was OSCP certified if I hadn't like had a conversation with them and treated them as a as a friend, you know, or as a as a true colleague. As a human, as a human being, can just say that. <laughs> yeah, as a, as a human being, and I, and I mean, yeah. it's such a big part of it. Like, you know, we've been frustrated for so long in the security industry that it's very easy for us to just dive into that hole of, you know, oh, it's just another auditor. But they can really be partners. Not all of them are going to be, but you know, start every relationship fresh and go in go into it with that and be willing to teach and be willing to learn. Yep. Okay. Well, the, um, we go. go ahead. Oh. No, no, it's all you. Uh, the other question was, um, what are your best practices and who owns the root of the org? Are you seeing InfoSec own that or cloud teams? Um, from my perspective, so usually the, the root account is in no one, it's usually owned at a pretty high level. It kind of depends on the org structure, but um, it's basically the credentials are in a safe, you know, the MFA device is in a safe. Anyone, if you need to access it, you usually have to have two, two different people to access the different, both the password and the MFA um, device. Uh, some folks do the whole Shamir secret sharing of breaking it up into different pieces. You have to have, you know, multiple people um, to access it. Um, but that's generally, it's some combination of kind of the business operations and security who are involved in that. Um, and it's usually been pretty high up. So, you know, uh, VP or CISO who has to be involved in that call to, to break those out. Um, for kind of more day-to-day -day break glass, the kind of admin credentials, those are usually in some kind of PAM. And then that's, that's usually, you know, um, in the break glass scenario, that's the approval happens or a lower level. And then kind of like what Ken talked about, they get rotated after that. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with all that stuff. I think one of the other issues that I come across pretty often is not necessarily who owns the root account, but who owns the MFA for the root account or how does that get stored or secured, whether that's a hard token or not. Um, and that can be pretty complex depending on what your, um, you know, what, you, what your security requirements are, especially if it's a hard token. Um, do you lock it away and like have two keys, you know, James Bond style and go through that process? Or, you know, it's, um, I think that's a, another big challenge because that's, again, a best practice. Have an MFA token on your root account, make sure your root account is sent to like, you know, some generic email, but then, you know, who owns that MFA token? Yeah, and if the CISO goes on vacation and something happens, who can access it? Yep. So it's always a trade-off. All right. Well, those are the last couple of questions. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you again, Ken and Mike. This was a wonderful talk. Um, we had some pretty good interactions in the discourse as we were going on. And I hope you all have a great night. Um, our next meetup will be on July 16th. And I hope to see you all soon. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank Thanks you very again. much for having us.